Recently, we've had some voltage fluctuations and surges in our home, and it may or may not have been responsible for taking out one of our appliances. It got me thinking about the necessity of getting a surge protector. And these are not new. They've been around for quite some time. So I thought I'd discuss first just what is generally, what is a surge protector? It's something that is absorbing voltage variation at the outlet, at the point where you're plugging in your, your devices. And then it dissipates that energy that is from the over voltage uh, or a surge current, I guess a spike current is, all, is also known. It's dissipating that energy within the device instead of pushing that into whatever thing is plugged into this device. So if it's my, my little charger that's plugged in, is that showing up? Yeah, then instead of it going into my little charger and then this thing happening, having to figure out what to do with that crazy amount of energy, it's absorbed and dissipated within the device. In extreme cases, like a lightning strike, this is designed to kind of, as best as it can, sacrifice itself and shunt all the energy into this device as opposed to it going into anything that's plugged in and connected to it. So there are some ratings that go along with that to kind of explain how capable the device is. And they say, uh, there's a, first the continuous duty electrical rating. So this device is rated 15 amps at 120 volts, 60 hertz, and its maximum power handling is 1800 watts. Then they go into the, what is it doing? So there's a maximum energy dissipation. And you'll see this, it's just basically telling you how much energy can these devices absorb and then dissipate as heat before the device fails. Also, how much current can it handle, uh, spike current? These are in very, very short duration. So this is, if we go to the, skip to the next line, all in events that are less than one nanosecond. Because what is intended to happen is it may absorb 1,080 joules of energy and then dissipate it. But by the time it's absorbing that energy for that period of time, disconnected from the outlet. Your device is not, is not connected to the outlet. So there's not really any more energy being dissipated because it's in a very, very high impedance state. There's no current flowing across the device. And so, yeah, there's, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but then there's this UL, as part of the UL listing, there's the clamping voltage. That's the voltage at which it will clamp down and shunt all the energy to, well, wherever the, wherever the energy is coming from, to either neutral or ground. And that voltage per the UL 1449 standard is 400, well, they're saying it's 400 volts. And that occurs within less than one nanosecond. Less than one nanosecond. Just bear that in mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then the EMI RFI noise filtration also is 150 kilohertz to 100 megahertz at up to 43 dB reduction. And we'll get to that in a moment as well. So these are the ratings that typically you'll see on surge suppression devices. That's what it is. The next thing is, do you need one? I would say in most cases, no, because in the last 20 to 25 years, many of the things that we own come with switch mode power supplies. I'm going to go into further detail in another video. Many, if not every switch mode power supply that I've come in contact with incorporates this functionality inside the device. Now, there are varying degrees of surge protection and the potency of the surge protection. And actually it's on the enclosure of this, of this device that says that is a type three surge protection device. I'm not gonna get into that in this video, but in a future video we'll discuss the different types of surge protection devices. So in short, these contain surge protection and noise filtration in them. Is the surge protection and noise rejection as potent as what's in this device? Noise rejection, probably yes. Surge protection, probably not so much. Do you need one for devices like these? No, most likely not. 
if you want to extend the life of them a little bit more perhaps and you know have something else be clamping the the voltages when there's a surge then perhaps you can get one of these you know but these are so inexpensive and generally don't i mean to get a supply like this costs like five or six bucks and this surge protector costs eleven dollars so it's kind of up to you depending on what you want it for in certain specific applications like high-end audio equipment or other appliances that use not switch mode power supplies but linear power supplies like this linear transformer which we'll discuss more in a future video they generally do not have as much of a robust surge suppression network on them by default and are more susceptible to transients. If you find yourself using a lot of devices that use linear transformers, then perhaps it is worth getting a search, a dedicated surge protector for that application. That said, I have bought these for a convection oven that I know uses a linear power supply for certain parts of the circuitry and might be the reason why this is actually from that um, oven and uh, it might be why that oven um, failed not because it was the oven that was defective is because of the the power conditions that are in the area that we're in things like that that run on linear supplies might want to consider a surge suppressor for it the next thing let's take it apart and figure out how this works it was kind of a pain to get it open. It had only one screw that was in the back here for this Belkin one. It, it didn't come apart cleanly. You had to obviously cut the UL logo off there and then pry on this thing to get it to all the way up and then open it up. It, it will go back together, I think, quite easily, but uh, taking it apart was no easy task and you can see that it is pretty chewed up. And it's because they want this to be pretty tightly fit in the event that this sees a very intense electrical event, AKA a lightning strike near your house. So how does it work? I'm gonna bring in a little drawing I made here and walk through what's going on here. So just looking at the board, there's an LED for the protected status and there's also a grounded uh, LED. And we'll go through those really quickly because I'm not gonna do a full reverse engineering of the schematic. So there's a ground LED and it basically, if I flip this around, there is a, a trace that comes up through a very beefy resistor that also has a thermal fuse attached to it right here. You can see it's kind of sleeved. And then it goes over to a transistor, which then is has a current flow to switch it on if it can complete the path all the way down the left hand side across this other current limiting resistor that then jumps over to here and comes over to this pad which is if you see, move this out of the way you can see there's a, there's a green wire that comes all the way up and goes to the ground lug that's floating in here because this whole piece is floating so that is the grounded side on the protected side it's a little bit more complicated for that, I'm gonna actually uncover the star of our show here, transient voltage protection, or the MOVs, metal oxide resistors. These are actually fiberglass, it appears. Like, a, I think they're vulcanized a little bit. They've got like some kind of rubbery coating on them, but I'm pretty sure this is fiberglass. And it's a fire retardant, a very fire retardant material that can handle, I don't know, a lot of, <laughs> I think, several hundred degrees before it burns and that's in the case of a end of life event or a extreme electrical surge aka a lightning strike or something similar that these were not able to sustain and they actually rupture they're contained in these these little sewn cool looking little bags so inside there is a thermal fuse for one of the metal oxide varistors and there's another thermal fuse here that is sandwiched in between two of them. There's one metal oxide varistor here that has one thermal fuse attached to it. And that is actually in series. The thermal fuse is actually in series with the metal oxide varistor and it goes right here. So this one on the left goes from line to neutral. It runs through the thermal fuse and then through the metal oxide varistor. And these two are actually you know, obviously sandwiched together as you see here. 
And then the other one is actually taking care of two of them with the thermal fuse in between. So this one goes from line eventually to ground, and the other one goes from neutral eventually to ground, but they both pass through this thermal fuse. And that is in the event of any sort of fault where the MOVs fail, where the known failure mode of MOVs is short. So they'll fail short, and usually before that happens, actually not usually, always before that happens, they get very, very hot because their impedance drops as they age. But that'll be, again, topic for a future video. <laughs> and uh, then the fuses open up, and these are rated at uh, 115 degrees Celsius. Basically, that's the operation. And you have an MOV connected between each connection in the triangle here, line, ground, ground, neutral, neutral to line, because you can have a transient occurring from one location to any other location. And so that's why they're connected the way that they are. It's usually an, an imbalance in line that gets shunted to ground, an imbalance on neutral that gets shunted to ground, or an imbalance between line and neutral because they're operating on each side of the, you know, the sine wave here, you have a, you know, on the negative swing, line, neutral becomes line, line becomes neutral. So there could be an imbalance between the two and that's why there's uh, protection across them. And then finally past all of this, we have the single capacitor, an X type capacitor. That is a 0 0.1 microfarad, actually rated up to 310 volts AC. It's actually rated above the clamping voltage of the MOVs, which is nice. So they did a good job sourcing the right components because as you quick calculation if you do about 280 volts ac uh, that's about 392 volts peak and movs are in their predictable devices but they're it's not like a linear region where it just goes on and off on and off there is a a region where these movs will begin to leak meaning they'll start to conduct partially and at 390 volt, 392 volts, they're gonna start definitely leaking to whatever, you know, between line and neutral, line to ground, neutral to ground. And so you're gonna be clamping off this whole circuit well before you exceed the voltage of this X, X capacitor. So that's why they picked the voltage that they did. And so this serves as your noise suppression that gives you about up to 43 dB as a single order filter between 150 kilohertz and uh, I think they said 100 megahertz. So that's really an overview of this surge suppressor. I will say the construction is quite good. I'm impressed with a few things. Some are just part of it being a UL listed device and, they, and in order for it to be certified under that, that standard, they have to have, I'm pretty sure, thermal protection. But, but it's nice that they do. They have thermal protection against the, the MOVs being overstressed and then opening, up, opening the circuit. I also really do like the fact that they are covered with these pouches so that if there was a rupture and molten parts were coming out, that they're trapped inside this before they would escape and be touching the inside of this enclosure, which is really thick plastic. I mean, this is not, it's gonna take quite a bit to get this you know, material, molten material through this or for this to start on fire, which I'm sure this is a, a fire rated material, definitely. To the, to the highest extent that it can be. The other thing is that there's, I mean, little touches like sleeving on the LEDs. These are not isolated, so they're likely referenced to line voltage. And then on the back, while the soldering could be done better, it's kind of a lot of flux left over on the board, like I've seen before and have mentioned in various videos. And I'm glad I can show it in another, another uh, device because I didn't want anyone getting the impression that it's like, oh, it's just ASUS or other you know manufacturers that I've talked about thus far. This is runs across the board. And, but the ground lugs are all, or the, uh, the, the lugs are all secured in two places and, and actually get secured, they're soldered, but they're actually mechanically secured through the board and then clamped on the other side here and provide really good securement. A low likelihood of a lug coming, pulling out of this, unless you really yanked on this thing. And even if you could, the line side, which remember, if you stuck a fork into the neutral side of the outlet, in the United States, nothing would happen because the line side is what's carrying the sine wave. 
so neutral, like if you take neutral and tie it to ground, you're going to get almost no voltage. So what they did is on the line side, you can see where this has actually got a, has a feature that comes out like this, and it's tacked in three places. And if this were to come loose, you couldn't pull it out of this enclosure because it has this feature that would get trapped inside and it would be trapped and contained within the enclosure. It'd still be loose, but, it'd be, but it wouldn't come out. If this came out or the ground lug came out, you could touch them and nothing would happen. But this one, you want to make sure it absolutely does not come out. I think that about covers everything. No. A few more things. There's good spacing across the board. And there is, I do like when they go through the, the work of putting slots in the board to make sure that the creepage distances are maintained, especially when you've got a lot of stuff in close proximity. On this particular device, nothing is really low voltage that's user accessible except for these LEDs. But the LEDs have, when they, I'm sure they did all their testing with dielectric withstand testing, which is basically how good is the entire package protected against electric shock. How good is that insulation system? These LEDs have like a, the base, they've got this whole chunk of plastic. And so while the LEDs themselves, my preference would be that they would be like covered in something so that you couldn't actually touch them. It's pretty good to have maybe, I don't know what that is, four or five millimeters of solid material that is a plastic encapsulant. Okay, I think that's all I've got. I do want to use this thing again, so I'm going to have to try to figure out how to reassemble it. I think I will do another video on this, going into more detail about how MOV specifically work, or I might get interested in something else and completely abandon that and come back to it eight months later. Anyway, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Take care.